brave adventurers to another presentation of the Retro Craptacular podcast, wherein we continue our search for the greatest horrible films on this planet Earth. I am your noble dungeon master, Aaron, and I am joined by my noble squire, Matt. Good day, sir. Good day and well met. All right, the pits. Oh, can't can't keep that up for the whole episode. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> I loved it. Did you? Okay, good. We won't such, redo it. Such then. an appropriate intro to this episode of our show. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that coming. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I practiced it in the car on my drive home yesterday. <laughs> beautiful. I know it's Love great. It. Uh, well, welcome to the show. Um, this, this, I mean, assuming people have seen the title of the episode and they'll know what's up, <laughs> why I did a stupid thing like that, but otherwise just a real fun surprise. If, if this just started playing <laughs> at random, then you're going to be very confused for a moment. How are you, man? Oh, not too bad. Not nice. too bad. Yeah. Doing back. all right. I, uh, life getting on a... back to normal back to normal no what no is it life getting back to normal no no has it been getting back to normal for you uh yeah more or less hmm you know, well, no I mean, i'm like i'm i will will soon be starting a new job oh, okay actually yes yeah because um yeah i mean i was working for a music school when covid came around uh they're not open <laughs> <laughs> no yeah can't be can't be around children these days Mm-mm. Mm-mm. no no yeah. no no i'm getting uh i'm getting back into the swing of things but slowly starting to get back into the office and finally got the go ahead to uh start shooting my series so that's uh oh yeah been starting over the last month we've shot three episodes so far so i'm really really happy about that um and that's awesome yeah i don't know how much a about it i can say yet but um we pretty much we've got the go ahead from my boss to produce episodes and then uh we basically need to produce like three or four so that we can take it to the head of the company and the uh president of television programming or whatever his actual title i can't remember his actual title but (laughs) Sounds the two, the the two guys that make the decisions about what goes on TV. So, right, yeah. So once uh, once we have it, uh, like yeah, I think we're gonna do one more, and then we're gonna send all of them to uh, one level below <laughs> the boss. Get them to look at it and give us feedback, and then we'll send it to the bosses. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So, yeah. Oh, cool. So that's uh, yeah, that's that's the, been the biggest development for me. Um, other than that, I've just been hanging out, watching shit. Nice. You know, went to a double feature of Empire Strikes Back and Wrath of Khan at the drive-in. Oh man! Yeah, that's an intense double feature. Good shit, right? Yeah, yeah. Holy smokes. I did fall asleep a little bit during Wrath of Khan, but you know, yes, they they start hard the to movie, blame you. They start the movies these days at like nine forty five, because that's when the sun goes down. Oh yeah, we're like right in the peak of summer, so the <laughs> the start times are getting later and later and later. So like Wrath of Khan didn't start till midnight. Oof. At least we're so. past we're past the solstice, so the yeah. days will. Yeah. Get shorter. Which I'm a fan of. Daylight yeah. is weird. You know? When you it think is, about it. It is, but I like being able to I don't like leaving my house in the dark and coming home in the dark, you know? Oh, right. Especially on days when we're in the studio, because then I'm also in the dark all day. And I just I feel like I never see daylight ever. It's like it's a very weird like um yeah i don't know it's a very weird sensation just be like completely nocturnal <laughs> at times um 
That so, is weird. So I like being able to like, you know, come home and barbecue something for dinner and you know, see You don't like barbecuing the in the dark? I, I don't mind it, but it's harder. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly more difficult. Well, I use a charcoal barbecue, so it's hard. You know, I don't got like, oh, yeah, big right. active flames to, in order to cook by, so I need to like use a headlamp or something like I'm like I'm mining for coal. <laughs> but I'm really I'm just mining for flavor. Oh. Ooh. This is why I work in marketing. There you go. Did you uh hey, did you see the trailer for the new Star Trek show? No. Okay. So this very, very weird thing that I just saw like yesterday, I think, for the first time. There's a new Star Trek show called The Lower Decks. And it's a cartoon, and okay. it's a comedy. What? It it looks very Rick and Morty inspired, huh. but like for a for a PG audience, I assume. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about it, but yeah, I, it can't be worse than what we've been getting. I like I don't know. I dropped off Discovery after like five episodes. I could not bring myself to care about that show at all. Right. I just never started it because of everyone telling me not to bother. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they did a really dumb thing, which is they spent the first two episodes um not not Ming Na Wen. What who was the who's the woman from Crouch and Tiger Hidden Dragon and the James Bond movie? Uh, mm, Michelle Yeo? Michelle Yeo, yeah. So Michelle Yeoh is the captain of oh. this ship that's not the USS Discovery. Okay. Um, and that's what the main character of the series is. So the, the main character of the series isn't the captain in this one. It's like the, it'd be like number one or. Okay. It's kind of the first mate kind of is the, is the captain or is the main character. And so the first two episodes kind of like set up the start of like the war with the Klingons. But like spoiler alert the uh, michelle yo and uh that ship i think i pretty get destroyed at the end of the second episode and so it's not until episode hmm. three that you actually get onto the uss discovery and then the captain of that ship hmm. is jason isaacs who is um mr slytherin uh no uh, draco malfoy's dad miss Mr. Slytherin? <laughs> Mr. Slytherin, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't whatever. <laughs> I haven't I don't I don't remember consumed that. Consumed Harry Potter media in so. years. I think it's Lucius. Lucius the, the Malfoy. Father. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Luscious. Luscious Malfoy. Luscious Malfoy. Um Man, when he's not being Malfoy, that's a really, really handsome man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> a very good-looking yeah. dude, but yeah. he looks so gross as oh, yeah. as luscious <laughs> as Mr. Malfoy. Yeah, I don't want to say it. <laughs> don't don't make me keep saying it. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh yeah. What about you? Have you seen anything cool? I've actually been on a on like a a pretty heavy Star Wars binge. Um, yeah, yeah. Where like I, <laughs> I realized actually um, when I was listening through our podcast to do our our fortieth special for Patreon, I mm. um, I listened to an episode where I admitted to you that I for some reason completely forgot to watch the last episode of The Mandalorian, and re-listening mm -hmm. to Shameful. that episode, I realized that I forgot again, and I still had never finished The Mandalorian. <laughs> Um, so I watched the last episode of the Mandalorian and I was like, that was really fun. I'm just going to watch the whole thing again. So I rewatched all of the Mandalorian. Oh, fantastic. So then I could watch the last one in context, which was really interesting actually, because I had been watching through it, you know, as they released it, um, week mm -hmm. after week. And then I had this long break of forgetting before watching that final episode. So to be able to actually watch it all in one chunk and see it as one solid thing really changed 
how I felt about the pacing and the characters uh, more than I thought it would. It felt yeah. less just like episodic. Um, I remember when it was going on, we were kind of like, oh, I want to see like more of these side characters. I want to see them come back sooner. But when you watch them all in a row, it's like it doesn't take that long for them all to come back. So. No, it's only eight episodes long, right? So, yeah, you know, the first three episodes are somewhat linked, right? Because I think it's the third episode that he decides to go. Mm-hmm. Or he delivers the, the child and then goes back and decides he's going to re-kidnap it. Yep. Episode um, three is called The Sin. The I'm Sin, sure. yes. yes. Yeah. And then you only got like three episodes after that. And then seven and eight are kind of like he gets the band back together. So it's mm-hmm. it's not... Uh, yeah, there's not actually... It's not as episodic as you think, but there is like the three kind of episodic middle pieces, you know, there's like, they're doing the seventh samurai kind of thing in episode four mm-hmm. with the, the Xena warrior princess village. Um, and then they're doing the ship rescue in the one, uh, you know, the prison ship one. And then there's, what's the other episode? Yeah, that one feels the most episodic. Um, yeah. Thing. The, the, the uh, other uh, one, it's, maybe they'll it pay starts it off with next him. season. Oh, yeah, maybe. That's right. Oh, yeah. I remember reading, too, that, like, um, so far the release of season two of Mandalorian has not been impeded by the pandemic. Apparently, it's, no, it's they still sh- set to come out in October. Yeah, like, they were already doing pre-production on season two before season one aired, and they mm. were pretty much shooting it as season one was airing. It was coming out, so... And they shoot Sweet. everything inside in front of a big TV. So it's like, even if they did need to go reshoot things, it's probably not that difficult to to space people out and do a do it safely. Yeah, I would, so. I would hope so. And as soon as I was done watching and then rewatching The Mandalorian, I watched the making of The Mandalorian and got mm, to learn yeah. all about the crazy technology. You had already told me a bit about it, but man, that's so cool. Yeah. It's uh, it's insane that uh, that whole process of just like filming in front of a giant, like it literally just a bunch of TVs stitched together, and you could change your set. Yep. As you see fit. Yeah. No, it's, it's cool. filming inside of a television. <laughs> yeah. And episode eight, that was the Taika Waititi episode. Yeah. So could you tell? Like, did you know going into it that that was his episode? And did it? I didn't. I didn't know going in. Um, I just thought it was really good. It was a lot of fun. It was, yeah, just like action packed, and I felt the stakes, and it was hilarious all at the same time. And then afterward, I learned that uh, once once it ended, it was like directed by Taika Waititi, and I was like, oh, of course, yeah, made perfect sense. So awesome. Yeah, uh, like you know, have we talked about the fact that he's getting us? full feature length movie i think i think you told me that that was a rumor or something is that a for sure thing that's a that's a for sure thing yeah they announced it on may the 4th i can't remember if we talked about it on the show (sighs) or not i don't remember either but frick awesome yeah i think it's i don't know i i think it'll be great i know there's some people concerned that maybe he'll be too funny but those are people that forgot that star wars was hilarious <laughs> so yeah i don't know I, I i think this episode proves that he can you know he can operate within the bound or the confinement of this ip and not be you know off the wall yeah i think so too so anyways, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and then after it. I finished watching all of that, I also then started watching Star Wars Rebels as well okay. as continued playing Jedi Fallen Order, the video game. Oh, okay. So I've just been Have doing you... those like back, back nice. and forth. <laughs> Did you get to Clone Wars yet, the new season? Oh, that's right. Sorry. I watched the final season of Clone Wars and then started watching Rebels. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So yeah. do you hear that the announcement that the Bad Batch is getting its own series? No, I didn't. Yeah. 
This is going to be a series about the Bad Batch? Yeah. Oh, man. That'll be fun. Which I'm, I'm kind of indifferent to, if I'm being honest. Um, oh, yeah? That was my least favorite part of season seven, I think. Um, mm. It makes sense now why it was in there. But uh, it felt it felt a little bit unrelated and unimportant. Mm. I guess that's you fair. know, because there was kind of three episodes. It felt like there was like three episodes, and then the story started. We're mm. like we're with Ahsoka. She's doing a little adventure. She learns about Maul. She shows up, tells the Jedi about it. Then you do the whole matter, and like that all seemed very connected. And I'm like, why did we watch this Bad Batch thing? Doesn't. <laughs> But I guess they're trying to set up. They're trying to set up uh, their own series, and so yeah. One thing I liked about it, because one thing, my favorite thing about the entire Clone Wars series has really been, um, like making that war actually feel like real, like valuable to the story. Because just watching mm-hmm. like episodes two and three, you're like, what the fuck? Um, but yeah. my favorite thing about it is is how it humanized the clones. Um, sure. And, like, so many of the characters are clones, and they're individual characters. They're just all voiced by the same person. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I guess did he? Do you know if he voiced all all of the Bad Batch as well? All of the Bad Batch. Man, that so guy's he's... that guy's range of voices is pretty ridiculous. He's a really prolific voice actor. Yeah, D. Bradley Baker. He's good. Yeah. He, uh... Yeah, I think he's he's doing all five voices in <laughs> the Bad Batch, but I don't think he'll get paid five times. Well, he, I think he works on enough that he can, he'll just be fine getting away with it. Yeah, that was probably, one, one thing probably. I remember too, where um, watching the making of The Mandalorian, there's a part where Dave Filoni is talking about um, how they were just in, in their kind of like pre-production, they, he got his friend D. Baker to do a voice for them. And I was like, oh, that's all of the clone troopers, that guy. Yeah. That, that's how they know each other probably is from working on other Star Wars stuff. Yeah, I don't remember what I was talking about before I went on this tangent. Uh, Star Wars? Doing, doing a lot of Star Wars, yeah. <laughs> Watching That's shows and playing video games. So much Star Wars. I've been loving it. It's good, man. It's good. Yeah. Let's, uh, should we get into the, the movie? Yeah, I think it's about time. All right. Here we go. We watched Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, we did. In a faraway world deserve to be free and equal. The child is not fit to govern an empire. The forces of darkness. You can control dragons. With the dragon army at my command, I can crush the Empress. This has got to be some twisted magic experiment gone seriously wrong. Have threatened to conquer a kingdom. What can I do to stop Profion? If you can obtain the Rod of Savril, you could control red dragons. I suggest we lay low, let the whole thing blow over, come back Rob everybody. There, there's one small problem. Problem? I kind of committed us to find it. Let the blood rain from us go! Trust me. I hate when you say that. <laughs> now is your time to die. Dungeons and Dragons. All right. Now... Have you seen this movie before? No. For some okay. reason, I thought I had, but I did not remember any of it. I have seen this movie many, many times. Oh, you have? Never by choice. <laughs> um, well, it was just it was just one of these things. It was like it was always on. Uh, I think space. It'd be on on like a Sunday hmm. afternoon on space, and so I just ended up seeing it all the time because hmm. it would play every week um it was either space or tbs i can't remember. i think it was space uh and so i was always like man this this movie really sucks like you know at first i thought it was like a tv show because it kind of looks like a tv show yeah um and yeah then i bought the dvd so that we could do this show <laughs> so I just, I just watched it this morning I found it very difficult to hold my attention If I'm being honest Like I had to watch it in two chunks 
Oh, yeah, one of those. I, like, got up, made breakfast, started watching it, and then I was just, like, so bored about halfway through. I was like, I'm just going to go take a shower. So I went and showered and <laughs> got another snack and sat down and kept watching it and was able to make it to the end. But, man, what a fucking... I don't even know. I'm really so, interested. I'm really interested to see whether or not we can recount the plot. <laughs> I don't know if I can. Like, I don't know why <laughs> he needed the scepter. There's like, Profion gets one scepter in the opening scene, and then the princess seems to, or the empress seems to be able to control dragons. And then there's another scepter that he needs to get in order to control other dragons. I, I just, I had no idea what was going on. A lot of magic scepters, yeah. A lot Dungeons of magic and dragons, scepters. baby. So maybe, well, yeah, maybe let's start about talking about Dungeons and Dragons itself. I, uh, along mm. with the copy of the movie, I ripped a couple of the, um, behind the scenes things and sent them to you as well. Did you look at either of them? I haven't. Um, okay. No. It's I'm not still interested it, to, but I have. It's not critical. Okay. For this discussion, but. Um, the one, the one that's really interesting is about the the history of the game itself, mm. um, and so uh, actually, there's two commentary tracks on the DVD as well, and one of them is uh, has one of the co-creators of the Dungeons and Dragons on oh. it. Yeah, wow. I got a little rant about the DVD itself later, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. It was back in the era when DVDs needed to be fun. Oh, like the menus and everything. Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. Um, so anyways, we we both enjoy uh, tabletop role-playing games. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or, or pencil and paper role-playing games, depending on what you want to, how you want to call them. Um, but you've played way more proper D&D than I have. I don't think I've yeah, actually played point. real D&D since high school. Yeah, because you we 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 really got more into it um, playing a game called Traverse, which is uh, very very different and much more simple than yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. But yeah, at this point now, yeah. I, I've played a bunch. I played um, played through the majority of a campaign, and now I'm actually I actually am the dungeon master for two different games. I recently started a new one, nice, one yeah. with my friends and with my family. So yeah, I've played it a decent amount now and very much enjoy it. I think it's really fun. Nice. Yeah. Uh, if anyone wants a copy of Traverse, by the way, just email the show. Um, it was a, created by our friend. I'm sure he'd be fine with us sharing the game manual. Probably. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I wonder if he's. I wonder if he's amended it at all. Like we, he would. He would update it as we played it. As like certain things would come up. You know. Yeah. We were like the playtest group. For yeah. It. Um. I think it's a really good starter RPG actually because it. It only uses one dice. It's a very yep. simple, you know, you roll the dice and then you add the number on the dice to the number on the skill you were rolling for. And then that was the number you have. There's none of this. All right. Now roll 14 D12s <laughs> uh, and a D4. And that'll determine whether or not you're successful. And then we can roll seven D12s and four D20s to determine how much damage you do. It's like... I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> yes, but I totally get what you mean. Yeah, Traverse is a great game to start. Yeah, um, for sure, because it is yeah, much more simple, and only the the game master needs to know what's going on, and it's very easy for everyone else to be able to follow along. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, enough of this talking about not Dungeons and Dragons. Let's talk <laughs> about actual Dungeons and Dragons. So here we go. Did you notice any like things specific from the the game in the movie? Because because the guy who created the game is like a diehard Dungeons and Dragons fan. Oh uh, yeah, and it was like his lifelong goal to get to be able to make this movie, pretty much. Like since he was a teenager. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't anything that that there there were a bunch of things that I could have been like oh this is this is how this would have been in in a dungeons and dragons game mm -hmm. you know where like oh he's got a jump from swinging axe to swinging axe like he'd be making some 
pretty serious acrobatics checks to yeah. be able to pull that off and and stuff like the main character is is clearly like a rogue archetype and yeah they're like a th- they're thieves yeah i don't know if there's a thief class or, or um i i don't remember i don't know what edition was out when this movie came out there there was a thief i think um, it would have in, been in fifth edition right now it's the rogue it would have been second or third Mm, yeah, I'm not familiar with those very much. Yeah, um, I think actually, I think the the movie kind of coincided with the launch of third edition. Oh, interesting. Because I think it was kind of around the time that uh, Wizards of the Coast bought out um, uh, TRG. Hmm. Yeah. Very so, interesting. Anyways, um, so yeah, there there were things that I could have been like, oh, this would be kind of like this way in the game, but there wasn't anything that particularly leapt out as like, oh, that's so Dungeons and Dragons. Aside from yeah. there being both Dungeons and Dragons, in Ooh, the there are there are both of them. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, in fact, I think the opening there's even a dragon in a dungeon. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, but I knows, think, but well, yeah, whatever. I think a lot of like the spells and stuff like that and the creatures um and there's not a lot of creatures there's like one weird floating eyeball like tentacle monster in one scene oh yeah no there's a cave it was pretty ridiculous actually that like that the floating eyeball with the tentacles that also have eyeballs on the ends it's called Mm -hmm. the beholder Mm -hmm. and it is a very iconic dungeons and dragons monster there you go but my understanding is that they're pretty big super dangerous very evil and like selfish and work alone and then for some reason there's this camp with a bunch of beholders yeah working with humans and with each other where i was like nah, that's bullshit and then also they never do anything yeah they're just kind of there <laughs> but they were uh, just there to put beholders in the movie yeah is pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, so like like I was saying, I, I know the director is a big fan of of Dungeons and Dragons, um, like his whole life, and and one of the producers, um, is as well. There's a great interview with him where he's talking about is like when I was in high school and I finally got a girlfriend, I had to convince her to start playing Dungeons and Dragons with us because I didn't want to choose between having a girlfriend and playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's like all right oh, man. these guys are these guys are lifers so For i think sure. a lot of the spells and stuff like i know at the end profion like casts a a ghost skeleton to like attack the empress and yeah one, i didn't like, recognize that 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 i believe is i think it's in the the making of thing they talk about that um like what spell that is and like a lot of the different things like even just her like casting the the ropes around them and Mm-hmm. like binding spells and a lot of the uh the artifacts that they find when they break into the magic school and the the final dungeon at the end where he gets the scepter um a lot of those artifacts are i think little easter eggs hmm. from That's what i remember cute. so yeah it's you know it is it is what it is but let's let's talk about the movie itself yeah because all these little easter eggs and stuff didn't exactly add to the plot um, Not really. Which is what is the plot, Aaron? All right. You, so you, you got you got Profion. He's played by Jeremy Irons Ugh, with the acting amazing. performance of the century. Okay, <laughs> the great. He does I burst the out most. So many times. Oh, he acts the most that anyone has ever acted in the history of acting <laughs> in this movie. It's amazing. The only way it could possibly be better is if you cast Nicolas Cage. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't that know would've... that Nicolas Cage would do more acting, but he would definitely do weirder acting. <laughs> That's true. It would have been stranger. Yeah. It's like he was the last one to sign on to the movie, and it was kind of he's the only big name in the movie. Well, Marlon Wayans was a name, I guess. And around this time, he would have been big ish, but. Not Jeremy Irons big. Mm-hmm. 
So he was the last one to sign on to the movie, and it was clear that they were keeping, you know, a significant amount of budget to get a big name actor for this role. And it's pretty clear that he knows exactly what movie he's in and does oh, not yeah. care. Like, no. just could not care less about Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> he he brings all, all of the ham. Yeah. So much ham. Which is uh, another weird fact is, isn't he also in Aragon? Which is also is a medieval dragon fantasy movie? I think he is. Anyways, not important. I'll have to look that up later. That'd be yeah. really funny. Um, huh. but yeah, yeah. He, so he he plays a an evil mage named Profiterol. Profion. Profion. There it is. Uh, except the Empress calls him Profion all the time. Maybe that's just to slight him, you know. Yeah. And you mispronounce someone's name on purpose. Like like Lando calling Han Solo Han all the time. <laughs> um but he yeah so he uh it starts with him stealing a scepter with a green orb in it that will apparently allow him to control a dragon which is conveniently locked up behind a door that he that the scepter is kept right in front of um they already had one ready to go yeah and so they open up the door and uh him and captain blue lips his his name is like Demeron or Deveros or... I think it was Denethor. Denethor? Because I, I, no, I, I thought that's I that's Lord of his, the Rings. But I thought, that's, I thought I remember them saying his name and me thinking, isn't that from Lord of the Rings? Um, Damodar. That's what it is. Damodar. Wow. Well, or Demodar. I don't know. That wasn't that um, far off. No. Uh, anyways... He, uh, they open the door and the dragon comes out and he's like, he's doing it. He's like, you know, going like, ooh, I'm waving my magic stick and it's glowing and the dragon's not trying to eat me. And they're like, you have the power of gods. You can control a dragon. (laughs) And then it stops working. And so they have to like drop a door on it. And it's very clearly just, they liked the Rancor scene in, uh, Return of the Jedi. (laughs) So they're like, let's do that. Yeah. Um, what and is then, sad. It was sad. Was a dragon in 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 captivity, and then they just killed it because they couldn't control it. Yeah, I'm sure Peta had a lot to say about that. But a lot to say about that great CGI. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good, no one could tell the difference. <laughs> um, then the dragon's blood drips into the river and sets the river on fire. Yeah. And I was like, is that a thing? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of either. It was a red uh, dragon. So, I don't know. It it could have been redder, if I'm being honest. I mean, that's fair. Does the color of dragon matter? Does it? Uh, In 5th edition, at least, yes, it does. Okay, cool. And the red dragon, I'm pretty sure, is like the... Like the most powerful of all the chromatic dragons, which are the ones mm-hmm. that are like red and blue and green. And then there's the metallic dragons. I was which, gonna say, yeah, there's some very gold dragons in this one. Yeah, I think the gold ones are the most powerful of the metallic, and then the red ones are the most powerful of the chromatic. And then oh, okay. that's why there's like a huge war between them. Well, that's not why, but it's just why it's those dragons. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so like, l- let's talk about the. Well, I guess we should keep talking about the plot for a little bit, and then we'll get <laughs> into barely the started. Then we'll get into the special effects. Well, okay. I mean, the plot is there's two two rogues, or thieves, whatever you want to call them, uh, named Ridley and Snails. Yep, and Snails is played by Marlon Wayans. And Ridley is played by a guy who will never work again. Um, Yeah. Which, honestly, (laughs) when I first saw him, I thought that he looked a lot like our friend Cody the Dancing Wiener, but if Cody looked like a huge douchebag. Like if Cody was hot like Brendan Fraser. (laughs) 
Like if you mash them together in the CERN collider and yeah. smash their atoms together, totally. And it would be this bad actor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Cody. Uh, I mean, he probably doesn't listen. Well, fuck you, oh. Cody. Why aren't you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Although if he does... He will probably dude this is the episode that he'll listen to if yeah i'm all gonna listen to Ooh, a dungeons and dragons episode i'll listen to that one fuck <sighs> he probably hasn't heard dancing wiener in a really long time yeah it's not like he doesn't know that we call him that or called him that in the past that was his nickname for several years yeah when we were all in middle school and assholes yeah what like he's the nicest dude ever like he's why so were we nice. mean My to him goodness. he's so fucking nice <laughs> ridiculously nice yeah Man. anyways um he does kind of look like cody though that's funny a little bit um so they're thieves and they're like hey we should go break into the magic school because because now the, the river's on fire <laughs> yeah the river's on fire so all the magic people are going to be going to do some magic to figure out why the river's on fire so there's no there's gonna be no one there and so mm-hmm. they break in and uh there's a, a mage woman there a low-level mage woman uh, named yeah it seemed like she was like an, an apprentice yeah to a, the older dude yeah there's like a classic like grand maester looking uh old you know wizard looking guy yeah, and uh it's like a wizard yeah and so they, they break in and they're like looking for stuff to steal and they end up getting caught um by her and then and then uh damodar shows up because they there's something that everyone at the magic school wants a map um yeah or, what was it um da-ba-da-ba-da-ba. is it a map it's a it's a scroll it's a scroll but i'm pretty sure that that i'm pretty sure it was just a map was it yeah a, some kind of magic well, map? but they you got know, a, map a little we'll, unclear <laughs> No, do they get a map later though? When he does the the thing, they the, they do get another map later. The yeah. three stage, yeah, and he's he's like lights it on fire in like a standoff. Yeah, all right, it's unclear. There's a piece of paper. It's important. They put their hands on it and say some magic words, and they get transported somewhere else. And that seems to kind of be it. Yeah, I think so. For that, um. So anyways, you know, they run into her and then Damodar and his troops show up and so there's a big chase scene and she whips up a portal real quick and they go running through the portal and then they crash into a dwarf and... Uh, Who's like in a pile of garbage? He's in a pile of garbage that also like leads into the sewer. So there's like another Star Wars kind of ripoff moment there where she's like... Yeah, they I'm definitely not- jump down the garbage suit, yeah. Yeah, except they make her not Princess Leia. Um, cause she's like, I don't want to jump into the sewer. And he's like, get in there and like tackles her into the sewer. Ugh, yeah. And like, to be honest, Marina like starts off, like she finds these two bungholes robbing the magic school and like snare spells them. And then they're just like tied up and magically they have to be within a certain distance from her. And so when she runs out of the room, they just like have to follow. And when yeah. she makes the portal, they have to go with her. Mm-hmm. And so she like snags them up and like she's the one who has the scroll and like whips up the portal and escapes and everything. But then as soon as those sequence of events are over, her character is useless. For yeah. The rest she, of the movie. She gets less and less agency as it goes on. I mean, she does have a couple moments. Uh, there's a, a showdown with Damodar um, where, uh, spoiler alert, Snails gets killed and... Uh, Damodar ends up stabbing Ridley and he's about to to um to kill Ridley and then she shoots him with some purple lightning and manages to whip up a portal and get them to escape. To, oh, that's right, because snails elves. had like snails had like stolen because he steals everything. Literally. He's just walking mm-hmm. by a marketplace and he's just taking things like constantly. I think it's yeah. kind of hilarious actually. Uh but yeah, he had stolen like some magic powder or something. And so she finds that, like, where he had been knocked over. Right. And starts using that. And I was like, oh, maybe that's why she hasn't been doing anything, because she didn't have any spell components. You could fix that in writing. 
Let's give her yes. some spell components. Anyways. Yeah. She could have a satchel. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. A little, a little purse with some spell components in it. Like a 10 item slot bag. Anyways. So yeah. So she does do that. And then she gets Ridley to the elves and gets him to heal uh, Ridley's wounds. But I don't think... Yeah. Like after that, uh, she's not really involved in the last battle at all. And even when he gets to the dungeon to go get the, the final scepter... Um, specifically only Ridley is allowed into the dungeon. There's like an invisible wall yeah. stopping her and the dwarf. And, and also there's a new elf that joins them kind of halfway through that Snails was flirting with at the beginning of the movie. And then um, they end up running into her again later. And Yeah, I think she was actually like with the the law. Like she was sent by the the empress to like oh right yeah because they had been branded um thieves and murderers um yeah unjustly and so they were yeah. like after that scroll the empress also wanted that scroll because everyone wants that scroll yeah and uh, so i guess we should talk about there's like there's like the main plot and then there's like the overarching like background plot which is profion and the council of uh is is he he's on the council of mages I assume so. And so, and uh, I think Profion and the Council of Mages want to get a dragon scepter or something from the Empress because she controls the golden dragons. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they want. I mean, they want it because they want power. Um, yeah. Whereas she wants to take like all the power and wealth that the mage class has and divide it equally amongst mages and commoners like she right wants yeah a, she wants equality and so there's literally the mages there's, yeah. which hold all of the wealth and power want her gone yeah there's literally a class divide mm-hmm. um which is actually kind of makes sense for a movie based on a game where you have different classes that you can choose <laughs> oh yeah i didn't actually think of that. but just in the in the game there's not really like in a like if you choose a mage, you're better than other people. <laughs> like it's not really that's not really a thing, but Yeah. Yeah, so it, it it's it's a basic like dungeons and dragons adventure, but there's like a higher overarching kind of plot to it. Mhm. Um or like there's higher stakes to it. And I I think that's kind of where the movie really fails. Is I think it should have just been a simpler movie. That would have been great. There, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's like this, you know, um, big class divide, race war sort of thing happening at the end where the empress brings all of her golden dragons to attack the mage citadel where Profion is, and they're like shooting fireballs at all these cgi dragons that are flying at them and then the red dragons show up and they're fighting um and it and it just it looks horrible (laughs) and it's like you didn't need to do all this you know like because the rest of the plot is basically like they got this map they need to go get another map from this thieves guild and that's um, where Ridley has to do this like dungeon maze where we were talking about earlier with like swinging axes and fire. Shit. Yeah, that had some pretty classic dungeon rooms in it. Yeah, um, which leads me to my tangent about the DVD. Oh, so I I get this DVD first thing I want to do. I'm not gonna watch the movie. Fuck that. I want to go, <laughs> but I notice there's some behind the scenes stuff. So I'm like, I'm gonna take a look at the behind the scenes stuff. So I pop in the DVD menu shows up. It's playing some. I mean, the one song that's in the movie. And, um, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. and that's, it, it. that's it. That's it. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, cool. left much to be desired. <laughs> yeah. And so I click on special features and then it does like a, it's like flying through a CGI <laughs> room and then it gets to the, the swing and hammers and, that's not the background for the menu. I now have three options. I can choose a bone, I can choose a sword, 
or I can choose a third thing. I can't remember what the third thing is, but so you you have to like have seen the movie and remember what's going to go on. So I click on, you know, bone and that gets me into the next room. Then there's the fire things. Then I, you know, select a different thing and it's like, nope, you died. You go back to the beginning. So then you got to do the... Yeah, then you got to do the the swing and axes thing again. So I'm like, okay, click on the bone. Okay, so then it must be the swords, and I click on the sword, and then that gets you into the final room. But it's like, I just want to watch. That's just to get through the menu. They yes. make you work to get through the they menu. They make you work for it, because this was like in 2000. This is when DVDs <laughs> had to be fun. It was like a new thing. Remember like the commercial that would play like... I remember it was on the X-Men VHS. It was like, are you ready for Fox DVD video? Oh, absolutely. It was like, with interactive menus and DVD ROM that takes you further into the experience. And like... I remember exactly that, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, you would buy DVDs and like under special features, it would be interactive menus. And like, that would be like a real (laughs) selling feature. And now it's like, look, I just want... I just want to get to the movie as fast as possible. And if I want to watch a different thing, I want that to be as easy as possible <laughs> also. Yeah, DVDs are not an experience anymore. No. That's no. not a good thing. I don't mind, you know, if you hide a little Easter egg in there. Or like, you know, I think the original Harry Potter movie, I think it had like some games that were shit. <laughs> but oh, you yeah, can fun shit games. Yeah, but it's like, you know, you could... It was like an extra thing you could do, so I don't know. Anyways, yeah, that that was my little tangent about the DVD. I'm like, this is fucking horrible. <laughs> the good thing is you only have to do it once each time you put the disc in. So like if you go back and then you want to go and watch some more stuff, you just you don't have to go right through to the it. dungeon. You don't, you don't have to do it every time. <laughs> well, that's that was, good at least. That was fucking annoying. Holy crap. Um, but man, yeah, this movie just, it looks like such shit. Yep. It honestly looks like a like a TV pilot or like a TV movie. And I did and a some, low budget one at that. Yeah. Well, here's the interesting thing. This came out in the year 2000 mm-hmm. from New Line Cinema. Yeah, do you know, New Line. Do you know what movie New Line Cinema released the year later? Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. That's what I thought, yeah. <laughs> this is the same studio that made the Lord of the Rings movies literally a year removed from this. In fact, actually, they were probably shooting the Lord of the Rings. I think they started shooting them in like 1997 or 98 yeah. or something like that. Like, Yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> how does that happen? I mean, maybe they literally spent all their money on Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and they're like... This is, this is too fucking expensive. <laughs> but, yeah, oh my god, it looks so bad. And so I did, like, a deep dive into, like, the IMDB things and, like, tr- was trying to, like, figure out, like, what, how they shot this movie. Because I'm like, it looks like such crap. Was it shot, like, on early digital, maybe? Because, like, I know, like, uh, Attack of the Clones was shot digitally and that came out in 2002. And that was, like, the first, like cinematic digitally shot movie um Mm. but like digital cameras had been around before so you know dv cameras existed so maybe it was digital but it's like no it was shot on film but it was shot with um like standard spherical lenses and not anamorphic lenses i don't know if this is interesting to anyone by the way so you can (laughs) No, but like go basically, on. But like so, like your basic like spherical lenses, like you know this one that I have here is like you have on all your like DSLR cameras and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, are like what standard photography lenses are, and what a lot of like low budget digital films are shot with. Um, but you, when you shoot like a big movie. You uh, like a Hollywood movie on anamorphic to get that widescreen. You shoot with anamorphic, and it like compresses the image onto the film, and then you stretch it out, and it gives it that cinematic look. It gives you the lens flares, the oval-shaped bokeh, and the out of you know in the background things are out of focus. So like, 
I think that maybe contributes to it a little bit. And the other thing is... Probably. I feel like it would have just been better if everyone was British. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if they all had a nondescript British accent. I mean, considering how bad a lot of the acting was... I, no, I love that idea. A bunch of really bad actors trying to do British accents. That sounds hilarious. Yeah, but, well, I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> it probably wouldn't have been good, like, with this cast, but, like, I think it's just weird to see, like, medieval fantasy and have American accents in it. Maybe. I mean, it didn't bother me that much, because, like, it, oh, it's fantasy, so they should all have British accents is kind of kind of a trope that I, I think is kind of stupid. Um, I, I mean, I get it, but it, it's it's stupid thinking, like, from a global perspective, right? Sure. Um well, because really, it's a world that doesn't exist, right? So, like, why would there be British people? But yeah. I, th- I think it's a little bit like Uncanny Valley, in a uh, way, where it's like you see people in fantasy dress up, and you they should. In, I don't know. In my mind, it's like, oh, they should be British because that's who dressed like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get it. Um, but I mean, what what really? I, I mean. Yeah, maybe it would have been better with British accents, but ultimately, I mean, our two leads, like the the two thief bros, were just acting like acting like two kids in a in a like late nineties sitcom. Yeah. Well, and and you know, if they look like they should be guest starring on. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm drawing a blank. What's a late nineties sitcom that wasn't very good? Or like an episode of Xena. Oh, yeah. Or, or like the adventures of young <laughs> Hercules. They're not good or enough like for Xena. <laughs> no, they're not. They can't do a British accent. Uh, <laughs> even though she's supposed to be Greek. Yeah. But you know what I mean, though, yeah. right? It's it's just... It's yeah. a bit of an aesthetic choice that, like... I, th- I, I think it would, it would play well. I, I That's just me. You're probably right. It's Alas, like a, that is not the film we got. No, it's like if you get an Imperial Star Wars villain that isn't an old British white man. It's like, it seems... Out of place. Uh, out of place, yeah. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, so that, yeah, definitely contributed to the the movie feeling very shitty. Yeah. I mean, as, along with the the plot, and so I didn't really take a lot of notes. If I'm being honest, um, I took a note about the Return of the Jedi uh, rip off mm-hmm. at the beginning. Uh, I did I did say that I liked that they had this like opening narration, um, that kind of like acted like a prologue, and it was like, oh, this is kind of like if you were about to sit down and play. Dungeons and Dragons, your DM would do something like, all right, so, you know, we're in the world of Ichthyrion or whatever the kingdom was not I don't remember. Um, Izmir? Was it Izmir? Hmm? Izmir, maybe. Yeah, that sounds right. Hmm. You know, we're in the kingdom of Izmir and it's ruled by this empress, but, you know, the evil mage uh, Prospero. (laughs) Prospero. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Yeah. Uh, you know, wants to get his hands on this scepter so that he can control all of the dragons, and and you know, you find yourself uh, in a pub because every Dungeons and Dragons adventure begins in a pub. Apparently, I mean, every adventure I've played begins in a pub. Was it actually? I don't think I've ever actually played an adventure that began in a pub. That's just yeah, a dude. funny trope. The first Dungeons and Dragons adventure that we played in high school together started in a pub. I and the, that's been and the first so thing long. that happened to me was my drink was doped. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, that oh I I have a few memories of that night, um, and none of them had to do with my own character. I don't remember who the hell I was playing. <laughs> I don't remember either. I just remember. At one point, I cut out a zombie a zombie that I'd killed. I cut out their heart, and I wanted to keep it. But our DM was like, you're just going to put a bloody heart in your bag? 
I was like, no, I'll wrap it in something. And he's like, what are you going to wrap it in? And I was like, can I cut a piece off of Chan Young's tunic without him noticing? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I don't know, roll stealth. And so I yeah. did. And he's like, yeah, you can. <laughs> it was great. That's so good. Oh. Yeah. I felt, the I felt I a little bad for our DM because he was playing with like four guys that, or three guys that did not give a shit. <laughs> and one very very dedicated player <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. so uh, yeah so I, I think the opening monologue actually was really good in that sense because it it kind of you know a- added to the experience of of playing Dungeons and Dragons it all disappeared very quickly after that but oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah I don't know do you have any thoughts anything you wanted to mention I mean, yeah, I I felt the same way where it started off. I'd be like, ooh, this is kind of Dungeons and Dragons-y, and it kind of got me a little jazzed. And then Jeremy Irons just, like, (laughs) overacts to the the extreme. Um, I'm just, every other line he has, I'm bursting out laughing watching watching this opening thing with him, like, making the, I think he was like making his own scepter or something or trying to get a scepter to work that would control the dragons. It was a little unclear to be honest, but um, yeah, him just going fucking nuts. Um, And then, yeah, and then we were introduced to the rest of our characters and we kind of went through that, like trying to steal stuff from the magic school and then getting the scroll and eating the piece. And I mean, I started taking notes of things that I just thought were really, really funny. Um, And there were not that many, and they were no. all within like the first twenty minutes of the movie. <laughs> yeah, um, I have yeah, one so... note for a thing that I liked, and it was the animatronic skeleton at the end that he gets oh. the scepter from. Yeah, he's got to go get like the I there's like a name like so and so's scepter. Yeah, and then he goes to grab it. It's in the hand of a skeleton, and the skeleton's like, Wah, "What do you want?" Yeah, I I liked that. That was real like. Tales from the Crypt, like, you know, late 80s, early 90s TV kind of fantasy thing. It felt like, or like, you know, even like a movie like Willow or something would have like animatronic skeleton in it, something like that. For sure. And it was also like the only practical special effect. And it looked, it looked not great, but like it looked great compared. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Compared (laughs) to to any of the digital stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. So I, that, that's the one note I took where I'm like, I like that. Um, other than that, I didn't like anything. It was all bad. So here, aside from the intense overacting of, uh, of, uh, the mage Profion. Senior Irons. Senior Irons. Ho, ho, ho. As well as, um, Marlin, who is just ridiculous the whole time. The whole time. So ridiculous. The whole time. Anyway. Um, so when they're in the magic school stealing stuff, there's a lot of animals. And most of them are in cages. Um, it didn't have to I didn't have to look very close to see that a lot of those animals were just stuffies. Were they? Yep. Oh my in fact there was one in the foreground, just on a table. Not in a cage, and I was like, "That's the stuffed animal of a gerbil." <laughs> okay, I gotta go back and look at this. Yeah, I was like, "Wow, that's tremendous and so dumb." Oh my gosh! And then, uh, yeah, there's so like the the scroll that they get that they leave with, um, like you have to go inside of it magically, and we get absolutely none of what's going on inside the scroll. Super dumb. Our yeah. like our our um mage apprentice Marina and our um main character douchebag, um, Ridley. Both, Ridley, yeah, thank you. Both go inside the the scroll, and then we just don't see them until they come back out. And then while they're in the scroll doing whatever and apparently overcoming their differences, one being a commoner and one being a mage. We didn't get any of that development. It happened all off screen. Really stupid. And in the meantime, his friend is with the dwarf who they've just met and has no reason to be with them. Um, 
but the dwarf is like trying to he's like telling a story about battle and eating a huge leg of turkey and i'm like <laughs> classic dwarf oh um, yeah and he's and like stabbing him with yeah the turkey leg <laughs> the yeah. turkey leg yeah <laughs> it was pretty funny uh and then his friend sees um an elf walk in and it's like oh babe and the dwarf is like elves are disgusting but then his friend goes and hits on her at the bar and then uh famadar or whatever jeremy iron's blue-lipped henchman comes in with a bunch of soldiers and they see ridley's friend who has his back to them at the bar but then the dwarf sees all this happening from up in the balcony and his response is to quickly hustle down the stairs and then like look back and forth between the two parties and then he just flips one table and shouts bar fight and immediately everything erupts <laughs> in a ridiculous fight. And I just imagine, I just, in that moment, I imagined like if it was the Dungeons and Dragons game and the, the person playing the, the dwarf, like barbarian character just like comes down. He's like, okay, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to start a bar fight. And the dungeon <laughs> master being like, okay, um, make a intimidation roll. And then he rolls a natural 20. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and he just flips one table, shouts "bar fight," and everyone starts punching each other. <laughs> oh, I thought that was pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm sure there's tons of stuff that made it into this movie that was like from the writer director's like personal gaming experiences. You know. Oh, probably. Yeah, I mean, like. That's there's lots of stuff like that. Like there's an entire series of books, the uh the Dragonlance series. That's mm-hmm. like I think the entire series itself is just based on an actual campaign that a group of friends did. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. There's the Forgotten Realms series as well. Mm, that's which right, is a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. This, this was a very very profitable um thing created by two guys in their basement in the 70s. Um big time. Yeah, if you don't know uh, about the history of Do Go On, you, Matt, and also the listener, or not Do Go On, Dungeons and Dragons, there's a very good episode of say, Do yeah. Go On. <laughs> uh, uh, Do Go On does a very good episode about the history of Dungeons and Dragons, where they do a full report um, on, yeah, how it got started and pretty much up until, I think both of the creators have passed away now, but... Yeah, basically chronicles the entire history of the game, and hmm. it's uh, it's fascinating actually how like it was like one of the biggest companies in the U.S. at one point. Like it was uh, this the company that was making uh, Dungeons and Dragons in wow. the eighties. It was they were just huge, and they had that uh, Marvel comics, and then they had the cartoon show, and oh yeah, the cartoon. Yeah. Oh. That cartoon is tremendously bad. I love it. So good. I have one VHS tape of it that I got <sighs> at a garage sale for 25 cents, I think. That's right. I remember that being like the pre-show cartoon that we watched uh, for one of our culture nights. Yeah. Yeah. Do a pre-roll cartoon. You know, I like to program, you know, I'm not just like, <laughs> all right, well, we're going to watch a, a thing. I'm like, no, I want it to be an experience, you know? Absolutely. As it should be. Just like a good DVD menu. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, um. Anyway, there was also one scene not long after the bar fight scene, where they all meet outside, and then Ridley and Marina come out of the scroll somehow, and we don't know what they did or where they went. But all of a sudden, they now know what the rest of the adventure is going to be. They're like, "Oh, we need to go to this place and get." the eye of the dragon which is the key to the door to a dungeon where we'll find the scepter yeah and i was like i can't believe you retained all that i i mean i know yeah (laughs) it's because it was was the plot points of an adventure and my brain absolutely can work within those parameters very easily okay so all right yeah but then i guess but then like the dwarf finally like says the thing that I've been thinking this whole time, which is what's in it for me. He's like, why should I come with you? Cause he's just, they bumped into him and he's just been like tagging along. 
Mm-hmm. And so he, he basically says, like, if I come with you, who's going to pay me? Um, and the two thieves dudes just point at Marina and walk away. Yeah. And then Marina's like, um, we can discuss it later. And it- also runs away. And then the dwarf, it like zooms in on his face and he looks into the camera. He breaks the fourth wall, looking directly into the camera, and goes, Hmm, that's a terrible way to do business. <laughs> and then it cuts. And I was like, what the fuck was that? Uh, yeah. Just, and there's no other breaking of the fourth wall. No one does it. But this one dwarf character does yep. and just tells us that that's a terrible way to do business. And then it cuts, and he's still with them, and he stays with them, and does basically nothing, just like Marina. Yeah, he doesn't really contribute in any way. Like, does he fight ever? Uh, really briefly, really briefly on two separate occasions in the movie. I'm pretty sure that's it. Like, aside from the first scene where they meet him, and not the bar fight? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's All two right. more after that. But like they yeah, they don't last long. Yeah, it was like they're just like, oh, it's a Dungeons and Dragons adventure, so we should have a party that has a dwarf and an elf. But they yeah. w- they weren't made characters so no. much. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um and then one other thing that I I just killed myself laughing. Cuz at this point, we've already been introduced to snails. Ridley's friend, who is absolutely ridiculous in his mannerisms and way of speaking, and loves to steal things constantly. Um, And we've also already seen a few stuffed animals. And so when they're in the town going to the Thieves Guild, because the Thieves Guild has the Eye of the Dragon, um, they're walking through a market, and he's just like, steals a pair of boots, and wears them on his head. And then he just like, steals a bunch of something and steals a bunch of this and then one of the last things he steals he reaches into a cauldron that's hanging by a by a stall and pulls out what looks to be a stuffed cat it's black and so it's kind of hard to tell but i definitely saw a tail and i saw its little face and in the next scene he is just holding against his body a stuffed cat (laughs) Oh, man. See, I didn't pay uh, close enough attention to this movie. I, Like I said, I found it very hard to stay focused on it. It was very distracting. What definitely helped me is that I started watching it, and then I was laughing so hard um, that my wife came and joined me. So I didn't end up watching it alone. Ah. Uh, and there was a lot to laugh about um, within the first half hour, at least. Um, yeah, but yeah, um, well, I think the first half hour after that is kind of like, that's when I, I, st- I stopped yeah, paying as close attention. It really and I, formulaic yeah. after that, where like only the lead character who's a white male does all of the things and all of the agency is taken away from all of the other characters, you know, yeah. the, the one black character dies and yeah that's right yeah snails dies yep and that's the only character that gets killed Mm-hmm. should yeah. have been ridley <laughs> yeah no kidding he's like not a likable character not he's really big, big douchebag yeah like i don't know if i could tell you like what his character trait is like I or any of their character bag. traits are really other than like snails likes to steal he's a kleptomaniac for sure <laughs> yeah um yeah, I don't know. But the the other thing that I actually really liked um was the ending. Cuz like like you said there's there's our plot which involves our main characters, but then the overarching like back plot is this whole like battle for the empire mm-hmm. that has to do with holding dragons that or holding scepters that control dragons. So that's all going on and so the climax of the movie is that climax where um yeah, the main characters are there and they've like tried to help but didn't help that much. <laughs> and then Ripley or Ridley um just destroys 
the scepter that controls the red dragons. Mm-hmm. Anyway, even though he like, went through all that trouble of getting it, he should have just left it there. Um, which I was really hoping, actually, that he was going to destroy that. And then all of the red dragons were going to be like, oh, yeah, if we're going to kill that son of a bitch who's been controlling us. Uh, but we just never see the red dragons again. I guess they pieced. Um, and then the empress the empress shows up and gets and with the her scepter and controls a gold dragon to kill Jeremy Irons. Yeah. And so like that it didn't even it didn't even involve the main characters in the end. But then the very ending of the movie, it actually goes to our our party of four players and they're gathered at a little um uh they're in a graveyard by um it's not really a tombstone it's a it's a stack of rocks and in the top yeah. rock it is carved snails mm-hmm. so it's his little memorial um and uh ridley pulls out the dragon's eye that he still has and puts it there for him and he's like you finally got your big score but i thought that was kind of cute but then the stone starts to glow and the name snails fades away from the top rock and then he like picks up the glowing stone and the elf is like ah, she says something cheesy and lame. I don't quite remember but essentially it was the start of their next adventure which was definitely in some way going to involve getting snails back yeah she says something like don't uh, don't question your gift or something like that yeah oh and, and then she says like your friend awaits and then like, yeah puts her hand on his hand and they all like you know put the hands over the stone and then they're all like sucked into the stone and go on what would be the next adventure in that campaign um which i thought was kind of kind of cool and kind of cute like maybe snails wasn't wasn't dead and it was like the beginning of the next adventure and i was like that's that's fun well guess what there's two more movies oh shit really yeah two more Dungeons and Dragons Wrath of the Dragon God came out in 2005. It was a TV movie. Uh, the director of this movie is a producer on it. Okay. The only returning actor is uh, Bruce Payne, who played Damodar. Oh, it sounds boy. like he's, he's the main villain, sounds like. And mm-hmm. then uh, in 2012, uh, Dungeons and Dragons... Uh, the Book of Vile Darkness came out and has hmm. no one from the original two movies, it looks like. Um, it is directed by the same guy that directed the second one. Uh, but uh, yeah, the quality looks about the same as this. <laughs> Yikes. Even though it came out 12 years later, it looks like absolute shit. So... Oof. We will not be watching those. But there Sounds is good. a Dungeons and Dragons movie slated to come out in 2022. Directed oh? by John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein. Who, I don't know, what do these guys direct? Anything I've seen? Game Night? Okay. They, oh. What? What? Like, they're like comedy directors? Game oh. Night was funny. But I don't know that I'd be like, yeah, give them Dungeons and Dragons. And then they directed the Vacation remake. Like with Ed Helms and Christina Applegate. Hmm. Huh. Weird. That seems like a horrible idea. All right. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, but you got to think like you should be. It shouldn't be that hard to make a good D&D movie these days. I assume not. Especially, like, there are, like, very famous people who would, like, be stoked to be in this movie. Like, Vin Diesel is a huge Dungeons and Dragons nerd. Oh, yeah, for sure. Fucking loves Dungeons and Dragons. And, like, Same Joel, with, uh, Joe Manganello. Joe Manganello? Yeah. He ha- he owns Gary Gygax's original dice. Gary Gygax is the guy who created. Oh, that's right. Yeah. D&D. Doesn't he have, like, he has, like, an entire Gary Gygax memorial in his basement or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Yeah. The dude is fucking it's well amazing. into it. There was a he like trolled someone so great on Twitter, where uh, some bro douche posted like a gym mirror selfie of his abs, and he's like, "I don't play D and D." And Joe Manganiello responds to it with his the his cover of Men's Health, <laughs> him just looking like an absolute 
fucking Greek god, like just chiseled straight out of stone, like the, the most fit dude on the planet. Yeah. And he's like, I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, dude, you just. Yeah. That's so Fuck. good. That's such an amazing <laughs> troll. Uh, uh, so, like, yeah, you got to figure you could get. Either of those guys would leap at the chance to be in that movie. Please get Joe Manganiello and not uh, Vin Diesel. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'd, I'd take Vin. But, you know, there's there's tons of there's tons of famous. Uh, yeah. Nerds absolutely. in Hollywood, man. Like. Who like Mr. T used to play World of Warcraft all the time, didn't he? Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Like there's tons of people like that. I'm sure yeah, Felicia think... Day would be in it. Oh, absolutely. I think she actually plays D and D with Joe Manganiello. Oh, really? So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's I think, great. <laughs> I think they're part of like a D and D group, but uh, yeah, it it it's got to be able to be done. So I don't know. I don't have a lot of hope for this new one coming out based on the two directors that are attached to it, but. Well, also, I don't think it'll be coming out in 2022 if they haven't started shooting yet. Ooh, yeah, that's a good point. But, so. I mean, maybe one day we'll get a really awesome Dungeons and Dragons movie. Well, and like, I don't know, like for me, I don't know what you would want out of it, but I think I would just want it to be simpler. You know, because I mean, Dungeons and Dragons, ultimately, when you play it, it's ultimately just a bunch of fetch quests. It depends on what kind of game. That's like a classic kind of D and D game, though, for sure. Yeah, but um, there's lots of different ways to play it. Yeah, but that, that's. I think it would just be better if it was smaller and simpler, and not about the fate of the entire realm. You know. Yeah, it should be. Three or four main characters that are that actually get developed and have some diversity. Yeah. Um, and then it should be a, a fairly simple plot, but then just like good, fun action. And I yeah. Would, and I'd be like, sweet, this sounds great. Well, and like take a page out of the Marvel book. Like, you know, Marvel didn't do Infinity War right out of the gate. Mm. You can build up to that, you know. If each movie is a, a you know, a different type of fetch quest in some way or another you could have you know a series of movies where they're going here to get a thing and then they got to go here to get this thing and they get a bunch of different things and then maybe the bad guy ends up getting all the things and he can construct the doom wheel or whatever and then like four or five movies down the line you do the big the entire fate of the realm is at stake but don't do it right off the bat just make it fun and simple like Dungeons and Dragons is about going on an adventure and slaying some monsters with your friends. And hopefully mm-hmm. at the end you get treasure. Like <laughs> in its simplest form, that's what it's about. Yeah. But uh whew. in its most complex Not form this movie. <laughs> it's a weird form of therapy that happens with a group of complete strangers at a community college and one guy who is fat shamed. <laughs> Oh, that is the best episode of community, it's in so my opinion. Good. It's so like good. Like if if anyone was like, I I wanna watch, I wanna try community, but I don't know which one to watch, I would point them toward that episode for sure. Definitely. Oh, that not fantastic. Not the Redux one they did with uh in season five with Hickey and uh his son, Tobias Funke. I don't know, I can't David Cross, is that the actor's name? Oh, I don't remember. I always call him Tobias. <laughs> yeah. It's Tobias from Arrested Development, but they did they did like a redo of the D D episode in season five and it's just it's not as good. Oh, I don't remember that. Maybe I didn't see it. But oh well. But yeah, that episode's fantastic. So good. And D is a lot of fun. But this yeah. movie <laughs> It's pretty bad. Don't uh, don't let this movie turn you off from playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know? Yeah. And don't let don't let stupid muscle bros on Twitter ruin it either. Be be like the smart muscle bros like Joe Manganello and play D and D and have mm-hmm. fun with your friends. Or look up some other cool uh, indie 
RPGs, man. I got uh, I got Tales from the Loop recently. I got the starter kit for that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That would be really interesting to play. And if you're into sci-fi, I got the Alien uh, oh, role-playing I play game. That one's so bad. It's so good, dude. It, yeah, it we mentioned amazing. Traverse earlier. Great intro game. Hell yeah! Like um, I said, e- email the show. I, I have to ask our our friend, but I'm sure he would be fine with me emailing that out to people if they want a copy of the rules and the um character sheet yeah probably i imagine so yeah yeah cool well um shall we wrap up the show we'll do the rotten tomato score yeah rotten tomatoes um i'm gonna guess that it's pretty low considering oh. how shitty the movie is Almost certainly. Mm, is it 29? Uh, that's a very good question. Let me just click on this button here. Oh, okay, there we go. No, dude, no. Lower? <laughs> yeah. Is it like 12? Oh, so close. 10. 10. Ooh, boy. Uh, yeah. They got a 3.6 out of 10 on IMDb, too. Although... <laughs> 69% of Google users liked this film. Oh, you mm. dirty Google users. This movie cost $35 million? What? How the fuck did that... And it only made Was that all at the box given office. to Jeremy Irons? <laughs> Dude, probably a fucking shit ton of it was, yeah. <laughs> Whew. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, Thora Birch was the empress. That's right. Yeah, no, I totally recognized her. I thought that was interesting. She's an American Beauty and Ghost World. Okay, mm-hmm. so she would have. This was the movie she did in between American Beauty and Ghost World. Oh wow. Okay, so she would have been kind of a big deal coming off American Beauty at the time. Oh yeah, I guess so. All right. <laughs> well, what do you say, Matt? What is it? <sighs> I mean, you know what? It's. Mm. It's a pretty it's a pretty shitty movie. Um but I think I just laughed too much. I'm going to I'm going to give it craptacular. It's craptacular. Okay. All right. I just I had a lot of fun with a lot of it. And then I mean, a lot yeah. of it was just really bad. It's I mean with most with all craptacular movies it's like don't watch it alone, watch it with friends. You'll yeah. laugh together and have more fun. Um and if you're doing that, I honestly I think that there's a lot of fun to be had watching this pile of shit. Uh yeah, yeah. I I'm going to give it one big pile of shit. That is one big pile of shit. Um even though I've seen it multiple times, um I just I don't know that I'd ever be compelled to watch it again. Hmm. I maybe mean, can't with, blame you. Yeah, I mean, maybe with uh, you know a group of friends like our our group that used to play uh, together. Maybe that'd be fun to have to a do. culture night with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I just I don't know. It it it, it was it was more painful <laughs> for for me this time around. Just just watch. Look up uh, Jeremy Irons screaming. Their blood will rain from the sky. <laughs> And so good. You'll understand everything you need to know <laughs> about this movie. Um, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Ooh. Next month, we're kicking things off in August. And by kicking things off, I mean the only thing we're doing in August <laughs> is we're watching Heavy Metal 2000. Oh, baby. Our, uh, we didn't mention off the top because I did my weird intro thing, but uh, this is... Our continuation of our movie series, The Distant Future, The Year 2000, uh, where we watch only movies that came out in the year 2000, um, which we also realized recently that that was the same year that we became friends. Yeah. So this is our our, our 20-year friend anniversary, which is great. Aww. Um, so yeah, it's the first movie that came out or that's on this list that has the the name the number 2000 in it which was a big part of me wanting to do this whole thing um 
was I'm like, oh, there was a bunch of movies. Uh, Dracula 2000, Godzilla 2000, Fantasia 2000. There's oh, a, yeah, yeah. a number of them. Some, a couple of those we're going to do later. We're going to do Dracula and we're going to do Godzilla 2000. But uh, Oh, yeah. I'm really excited for those. <laughs> and then, and, you know, and then I just looked up like other movies that came out in this year. And it's a very weird year. It's It's not quite the 90s. You know, but like we just had the Matrix and we had the Phantom Menace and those kind of like kicked off a bit of a paradigm shift in Hollywood. And by the time you get to 2001 with the Lord of the Rings movies, Mm. I think the status quo quo kind of changes a little bit in terms of like what a big Hollywood blockbuster is. Yeah. And like the Harry Potter movies came started coming out the next year. So... It's kind of a weird time capsule year where, like, you could still do these, like, one-off movies that aren't based really on anything. I mean, some of the movies that we're doing here obviously have, you know, Mission Impossible 2, and we did Hollow Man, which is, like, The Invisible Man, and Shaft, and, you know, Battlefield Earth was based on a book, Dungeons and Dragons based on a game, but, like, a lot of these things, uh, you know, a lot of movies came out that year that were, like big huge expensive original movies like like gladiator came out that year and that's a movie that would never oh, get made yeah you know so the gladiator now would probably be like an hbo series or an amazon series like yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> it would never get a big theatrical release it would never win best picture huh. so yeah, it's a it's a strange time capsule year, which is why we I kind of decided that we should do this. But also, I just love the fact that movie studios were like, "Oh, if we tack the number two thousand onto the end of a movie, it'll make it cool and hip and relevant." Like, and it worked. Like I remember um, <laughs> Kevin Smith telling a story about going into the Weinstein Company, or I guess it was the Miramax offices at that time, and talking to he who shall not be named. Um. And being like, yo, man, why are you making Dracula 2000? Like, what the fuck? That was like such a piece of shit. Why the fuck are you making that? He's like, it's called Dracula 2000. Obviously, it's going to make money. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. It's just like this like weird, cynical attempt to appeal to Gen X. I don't know. But it's weird and dumb, and I love it. So that's what we're doing. Yep. Um, I think that's it, right? That's the show. That's the show. Watch Heavy Metal 2000 if you want to, uh, and watch the original Heavy Metal if you uh, if you want before it's f- for some context. Great, mm. sort of like one of the first bits of like American. Well, I mean it's Canadian actually, uh, but oh. North American. Yeah, it's really cool, right? Yeah. Adult animation. Mm. You know, like like animation in North America specifically for kids in a country like Japan. It's, it's, you know, treated as a more serious medium, but um, this is kind of one of the first mainstream, I mean, it kind of, it's a cult thing, right? But uh, pieces of like adult animation and, and it's inspired by a French magazine, whatever. It, it, it was important. <laughs> the point is it was Just important. Just watch it. Just watch it. It's really cool. There's t- if you like boobs, there's lots of them. Just go watch like every every segment has boobs in it pretty much um yeah all right cartoon boobs man anyways that's it for us uh this week if you like the show please remember to um oh fuck okay Sorry, how it's kind of text from my mom um if you like uh, the show please remember to uh, rate the show on iTunes and leave a review. It really helps a lot. You could tell a friend, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app, whether it be Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube or iHeartRadio, Google Play, um, pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. We're on all the social medias, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at RetroCrapPod, or RetroCrapPod at gmail.com. Uh, you can send us uh, a link. Oh, I want to give someone a shout out. Actually, they sent us uh, a, a link to a movie on Vimeo. And when I say movie, I mean it was about 26 minutes long. Um, and they said, here's a bad movie for you. And I was like, 
yep, that is a bad movie. <laughs> I got about a minute and a half into it and I shut it off. It was absolutely Ooh. atrocious. And I was like, I'm not even going to tell Matt about this because... Just going to spare me? He, he he doesn't need to see it. I like got about a minute and a half in, I scrubbed through, and I was like, that sucks. But if you want to destroy my sweater and send <laughs> us some cool... <laughs> whoa, whoa, uh, whoa. Uh, some cool recommendations, then uh, yeah, hit us up at the email or on Twitter. Uh, and that's the best way to get in touch with the show. And that is pretty much it. We'll be back. Did I hit all the things? I think I hit all the things, right? Ah, probably. Yeah. Uh, the guy's name is Thomas, by the way. So thanks, Thomas. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you were serious or not or whatever, but you were right. It was a bad movie. I could not handle it um so yeah great great uh we yeah we'll be back next month with heavy metal 2000 um also just heads up like most of the um most of the movies this year we've already like pre-selected so if you do have recommendations we might not get to them until january but we always like to uh, you know, just hear what you guys have to say. If you got a comment, you got a question, I'd love to have like a question segment at the end of the show. We've had that a few times. People have asked us for like movie recommendations and stuff. So yeah, I feel like we could we could do a good segment on the question: Why are you guys such wankers? You know? Yeah. Uh, someone did ask us, <laughs> "What the hell were you even talking about for the first thirty minutes of this show?" <laughs> Uh, which I believe was a reference uh, comment, a YouTube comment about the Battlefield Earth episode. I think which so. Which we really didn't want to talk about the movie, so we talked about all kinds of stuff beforehand. Yeah. For like half an hour. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, it was a good time. So, um, what the heck was that even for the first half hour? That was us being avoidant, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, we... Look, we do this to ourselves, okay? Yep. It's really and not... Our, and our reward is, is is being able to catch up with each other. And we yeah. just re- record it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right. So, until next time, that's everything I got to say. <laughs> How about you? You got anything you want to add? Nah. I think you that's never good. do. That's fine. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening, everyone. Keep watching crap. DVD video. Hold on to something. I've never seen anything like this before. Unbeatable movies. Gotta see this. Oh, so Granny says she got game. Grandma knows she got game. You can't beat the dredge. They're pure energy. There is something down there. Hi, big mama. <laughs> Damn, you fine. Enough what you think. That's an image that's gonna keep me up tonight. Unbelievable features. You're not the only one with gifts. Cutting edge 3D menus. Where am I? Why wasn't I told about this place? Director and actor commentary. I tried to come up with some signature X File visuals. Run. Alternate endings. Deleted scenes. Deleted scenes. Documentaries. DVD ROM. I need you on this. Good morning, Dave. You've got to get me one of these. Get Fox DVDs. The movies you want. The extras you'll love. That's game. 